Good morning, everyone. Welcome to our third and final day of this year's conference. It's my great pleasure to announce our keynote speaker for today, Dr. Coleman Dunahy, who's from the Dundalk Institute of Technology and University College Dublin, and who will be talking about a very interesting subject today about English criminal law in an Irish colonial setting. The floor is yours. Great. The computer is yours. Thank you very much, Nina. It's probably best to, to wait until after the talk to see if it was really very interesting or not. Uh, I'm sure <laughs> we'll it have will to wait be. and see. Okay, well, thank you very much for, for making it out on the Saturday morning. I think this is probably the most difficult one. Usually it's the after lunch sessions that people try to avoid, but um, I'm very grateful for your presence here um, today. Um, I want to talk for a little while about um, the nature of Irish criminal law and how it works in Ireland. Um, and I was surprised that uh, we were, I went for dinner with a few friends last night and there was a little bit of sort of surprise around the table that I was choosing to use a word like colonial about Ireland, which is very much, you know, part of Europe, albeit on the very edge of, of the, the kind of medieval Europe that we know. Um, so I'll give you a little bit of background as to the, the nature of the development of Irish common law in, in the Middle Ages and how crime and punishment might have worked. And then I, I'll, I'll sort of introduce you to some arguments around how it works in a colonial setting, how the Irish might be considered by English people at the time as maybe not entirely sort of European or not within mainstream European society and some ideas around, you know, very sort of judgmental terms like barbaric or civilized and I'll be doing magic book marks quite a bit uh, during the talk. And then uh, just one or two problems with my research that I see developing as we as we come through the uh, through the PowerPoint about where I think things work or don't work. Um, on the, the PowerPoint behind is a good friend of mine, that's the Bishop of Waterford and Lismore, who was hanged for sodomy in, he's probably one of the first people to be hanged for sodomy in Ireland in, in 1640. He's a bishop, um, but he's also a lawyer, and he's um, he's a, ostensibly he's the sodomy charge is how they get rid of him out of Ireland, rather than the reason why he is executed. He's executed because he's a a strong bishop recovering lands in a in that had been um, uh, originally belonged to the church, but were taken over by the colonial and he's trying to restore them to the power of the church and that's really the reason why he, he ends up going and there is his co-accused, his, his, his um, criminal conspirator or his, his lo lover if you prefer uh, there beside him. Um, he's, a, he's an interesting sort of a character in, in a whole host of different ways. So I suppose if you're not familiar with Ireland, uh, let's see if I can get this to work now. Sorry. Oh, there we go. If you're not familiar with Ireland, the close relationship, if you want to call it that, between Ireland and England, or later Ireland and Britain, began in 1169 with a, a Norman invasion of Ireland. And from then up until probably around about 1600, the existence of the English colony within Ireland waxed and waned over time. Uh, sometimes the Gaelic Irish or the indigenous population of Ireland were in a position of strength and the English colony was, relatively speaking, quite small, maybe less than 10% of the island. At other times, the Anglo-Norman or English community was quite substantial and, um, and they dominated the country in many respects. And I just picked out this date of 1495 and marked it down as a potential watershed moment in Irish law. By the way, if, I'm, if I introduce any terminology or concepts that you're not familiar with, I realize I'm the, the kind of furthest away from Belgrade in terms of the kind of material that I'm doing. So feel free to stop me and ex if, I'm, if I'm assuming something and, and you're not fully aware of what I mean, please don't, don't be afraid to ask. There's three acts up there behind me and they're all passed in the same parliament and I think by nothing more by coincidence. And the first one is, I'll just remind myself what's the first one. The first one is an act called Poynings Law and it says that no legislation passed in an Irish parliament can be preceded through the parliament without first getting permission from the king in London. So it basically establishes a much firmer form of kind of what we might call remote control government, meaning that London has a much stronger uh, say over Dublin affairs um, than had previously been the case. And it, it kind of, 
is a, a very sure way of putting Ireland into a European context, you know, where we have composite monarchies across large parts of Europe and the difficulties that monarchs have in controlling multinational, multi-ethnic, multilinguistic uh, entities. And this is one of the ways that they do it with Ireland. The second act then, the one in the middle, is an act that all statutes up to that point, up to 1495, so this is legislation, all statutes passed in England dealing with public law as opposed to private bills um, are from that point onwards uh, good in law in Ireland. So it's a whole, uh, wholesale legal transfer of all statute legislation transferred across over to Ireland and as such then it brings Irish law and English law into a very close almost perhaps even identical system at least as far as statute law goes. Now we also have what's called a common law system in Ireland which means that um, judge-made law where judges come up with legal solutions can be once they're reported upon they become part of legal tradition and then they become part of that common law. Obviously within Ireland Irish judges might be making a slightly different uh, solution to problems that they come across that may not get reported in England. So there may be some differences in terms of that common law aspect of the law, but the statute law at least is the same. And then finally, and here's where the contradiction arrives, and when you deal with Ireland and England, you're going to find a lot of contradictions. The final act says that an act that uh, murder of malice prepensed is made treason. And what that means is that premeditated murder or a standard murder by today's standards is to be treated as a treason. There's generally three categories of criminal law in Ireland, a misdemeanor, a felony, and a treason. A misdemeanor is a relatively harmless, well, relatively harmless, depends on your opinion and whether you're the victim or the assailant, I suppose. But, but relatively speaking, not, not a death sentence. It might be just a short spell of public humiliation or maybe quipping or something like that. The felony generally carries a punishment of a, a death sentence. That's usually the, the way that we distinguish between the two. And finally, treason is a standard similar to what your understanding of treason would be in continental Europe. Offences against the king, offences against the kingdom, uh, having sexual relationships with the queen, attacking a judge on duty, attacking a diplomat on duty, uh, that sort of thing. But this is a standard murder that all of a sudden is upgraded to a treason, which wouldn't really be in most people's understanding or capacity of understanding as to what treason might be. And the reason that's given is that the Irish have never taken the punishment for murder, hanging, that seriously. So they need to, to sort of to get tough on crime and it's institute a more horrific punishment. And the punishment for treason in Ireland is hanging, drawing and quartering, which I think is probably not something you have on this side of the continent. So if you've seen the film Braveheart, for instance, somebody was talking about it yesterday at coffee. At the very end of it, he's hanged, drawn and quartered, by which I mean he's brought to a place of execution on a, a hurdle, a little kind of platform dragged along the street. He's hanged from the neck for a few minutes, so he's in pain but not yet dead. And then he's cut down uh, from the rope. He's placed on a table. Uh, they remove his private parts. Uh, then they cut him from down there up to here. They take out his insides. They burn them in a fire. And they cut off his head. And then they cut his body into four parts. And they place it on prominent places like city walls or on the highway into the town. And what it's saying, so these three acts at one point is saying, Ireland should be replicating England in terms of its law, and we're establishing that. It's bringing Ireland into a much closer supervision from England, which we see in the top act. And then at the bottom, it's saying Ireland's quite different, so we're going to treat it very differently. So the contradiction in some ways for the relationship is England is always saying to Ireland, be civilized, be like us, become English, become Protestant, live in towns farm and run your economy the way we do and when you see all the benefits of becoming English or benefits of becoming English or becoming British you'll become more civilized and you'll be a lot more happier and all that sort of thing but at the same time it's saying we're going to treat you very differently at the same time and that's one of the reasons why it brings that up now before this point we have at about the same time a hybrid legal system in areas called March areas, I don't know if the terminology is used on this side of the continent, it comes from an old German word called Mark, meaning border area, and it's a hybrid legal system where people living in these border areas take a little bit from the English legal system, they take a little bit from an indigenous Irish system called Brehan law, it's very similar to the early Germanic law codes that Professor Simon was talking about earlier, or sorry, yesterday uh, morning, 
discussing things like uh, compensation payments for harms done, what in modern legal systems in America or Britain they would call a system of torts, where you can sue somebody for compensation for the harm that they've committed against you, tended not to have a much of a, a, a corporal or capital punishment element. There's very limited forms where it might be used. Sometimes you'll get something like blinding used when you take political hostages, but as ways of punishing somebody for murder or theft or assault or something like that, it tends not to use these systems. And it's worth knowing, just in terms of Ireland, this colonial system, before the English takeover of the island is completed in 1600, this hybrid system is used on occasion. And so it's a system whereby it's both Irish and English, and also people who are mixed ethnicity, essentially, who are living, because when you're living on the ground, it's great to read the law books, but sometimes they don't tell us much about what the actual practical experience of the law is on the ground as people are living and working and marrying and falling out and, and coming to, to, to agreements. And so it's quite interesting that in this system we have, you probably can't see it, by the way, I'm happy to share these slides that anybody that wants them, you can get in touch with me through Nina or on my Twitter. But what's most interesting to me is that, first of all, there's a, a what essentially is a system of arbitration. We should have got the arbitration people in for this talk because Irish law does arbitration quite well in the Middle Ages. And we essentially have a panel of judges, of arbitrators, and at the top there's English uh, officials, like a sheriff who's a royal official and a royal appointment in that list. And then there's also men of Irish names who are from traditional Breton law families, so they're in kind of inherited status of judges in the Gaelic Irish system. And what's really interesting from my point of view, not necessarily for today's talk, is that at the bottom, the name there, the red, is Dame Eleanor Fitzgerald. It's a woman, a woman judge in Ireland in the 1540s. She's the lady of the land. Her husband has died. Her, her children are not yet grown up. So the status that she has allows her to sit in a judicial function, albeit in a well, what essentially is the system of arbitration rather than a, a civil matter as we would understand it today. And I'm, I'm very conscious and I agree with what was said yesterday about the need to maybe not put these 19th century standards of what's criminal and what's civil on 15th or 9th century uh, legal history. And I think that makes a lot of sense. So um, moving on then, the, the law in early modern Ireland or in late medieval Ireland, the, I'm talking now about English law, where we have a sort of a definable common law system of, of criminal justice. It's really not all that different from the standard of what we understand criminal law to be today. The, 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 the major things that the criminal law should be doing is there uh, for the same sense. Its origins really are probably two or threefold. Number one, to keep the peace. You can't have individuals seeking revenge because that leads to chaos and mayhem and violence over spills. So the state undertakes prosecution on behalf of the individual, and it prosecutes and punishes the individual. It also um, raises funds for the state because there's a lot of fines used, and this is the case from the medieval period as well. So there's profits from justice to be garnered for the state as well. Um, and also there's a sense, and I think this becomes quite important in Ireland, that justice is a, a useful vehicle or platform for the state or the monarchy to um, to, to sort of project or to promote their majesty, their, their, their power, do you know? And so symbols like a, in Ireland it would be a harp is the Irish national symbol. It's a, an instrument, a music instrument, but it's always in a, in a court with a crown sitting on top of us. And it's a very important, and all of that symbolism means a lot, I think, especially in a pre-literate or a semi-literate um, environment the symbol becomes very, very important and it's seen. But like I say, most of the essentials are covered. Homicides, the difference between murder and manslaughter, the intentional or the semi-unintentional, theft, burglary, assaults, rapes, treasons. Obviously, we, 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 some of them have changed a lot over time, like the nature of what burglary is or the nature of exactly what something like sexual assault might be changes considerably over time. Um, but the, and there's also growing areas, for example, of things like corporate law, which bring in a, a criminal element. You know, I, I, I just, just actually a, a few weeks ago, I published an article in the Journal of Legal History where I tried to figure out exactly what is criminal law in early modern Ireland. You know, so for example, we have a lot of acts, maybe a piece of legislation 
for, on taxation, we'll say, for importing goods into Ireland, and it's got maybe a hundred sections in the Act, so it's quite a long Act by by early modern standards. Two sections in the Act deal with um, the punishment for people who are essentially smuggling goods into the into the island, and the punishment is to go to the House of Correction, which is a very early version of a, a prison. Um, and so the question there is that tax law or is it criminal law? Because it has a criminal sanction within it, but it's, it's ostensibly it's a, a taxation law issue. And interestingly enough, things like environmental law is used quite a bit as well, which I think is is quite interesting in that um, that that people are thinking about uh, protection of the forests, for example, protection of waterways, criminal sanction for those who would kill spawn, uh, fish eggs in the river, things like that. It's very very important at the time. It's part of this imperial project about whether there's always a common sort of an anti-English trope in Irish society that when the English come, they chop down all the forests in Ireland, which there is some truth in, and that's very much part of any imperial exercise is the extraction of mineral wealth from from the, the colony, be that in South America or Africa in the 19th century or anywhere else. Um, but very interestingly, like I said, there's a sense that in Ar Ireland's law is never perfectly mirroring that of, of England. So it's based on it, generally speaking, but it's important that it's never a full and absolute replication. So, for instance, I saw on one of the PowerPoints yesterday, somebody was mentioning a law of habeas corpus, which is a common law writ, basically saying you shouldn't be put into prison without charge. You, ha you can't be kept indeterminately in prison. You have to be either charged or let go, and they have to hold your trial within a reasonable amount of time. That law, which is a very, a really important um, law of the liberty of the person from 17th century England and it's seen as being a sort of a linchpin act in terms of the glorious revolution of England and what makes what one of these issues that makes England modern that is not applied to Ireland and it's not allowed to apply to Ireland and when they try to apply it a hundred years after it's passed in England a chief justice in Ireland says you can't apply acts like this for the liberty of the subject in Ireland you can't give equal status to people in Ireland as you have in England, be they Protestant or Catholic, be they from the colonial community or the indigenous community, because it goes against the very grain of exactly what the colonial relationship is. You can't have the the colonized country being equal in status or liberty to that of the of the um, of the, the the mother country, the imperial mother country, for want of a better uh, sort of a word. Um, this book is fast becoming one of my, my favorite books of all time. Um, a student asked me the other day, because I teach historiography sometimes, you know, the history of history, and he, he was asking me what my favorite book, and I said, what a ridiculous question. How could anybody who spent the last sort of 20, well, for bit, 25 years now studying history and legal history have one singular favorite book? And then as soon as I thought about it, when I saw the slide today, I said, this is quite possibly one of my favorite books. This is a very interesting book. It's, it's published by... A, a legal professional who's appointed Solicitor General in the 1610s, I think, Attorney General in the 1630s, or 1620s, 1630s. He collates a book of Irish statutes and publishes it, one of the very earliest, not the absolute earliest, but one of the very earliest books of Irish statutes where we actually collect them, because up to this point, they're written on manuscript, on vellum, in a roll, and they're kept in an office. And we have a real massive problem in Ireland in 1922 during the Irish Civil War uh, because uh, anti-government forces pull up essentially and take over the court system which has the uh, attached to it the, the treasury where all of Ireland's administrative and legal records are kept and this building they turn into an arsenal and to a bomb making factory and then one shell from outside goes into that building and boom in literally about a minute all of Ireland's legal records, or almost all of them, go up in smoke from the Middle Ages, the early modern period. A, a few bits and pieces that didn't go into the archive survived. In one way, there's a danger when we build these wonderful archive buildings, collect everything in the one place. If something goes wrong, it goes horribly wrong. Um, but a book like this becomes very important because he's very much of that colonial community, and he's trying to identify, and I often ask myself, why would somebody write a book like this? It's essentially a how-to guide, how to do criminal justice in Ireland, and he literally goes through his chapter list. Again, you probably can't see it on the screen, but he's literally going through things like 
felonies, felonies of common law, murder, manslaughter, just identifying what is the law in Ireland, because we don't fully know, because we've got a mix between statute law, legislation passed by a parliament, and those common law judgments where the judges sort of, they don't necessarily invent or create the law, but they, 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 they bring us to an understanding of what that common law is, if you know what I mean. Um, and I think there's probably two reasons why a book like this might be written. In one case, it may be an educational book for the native population of Ireland so that they might perhaps understand what the law is. And that's just a little theory, and I don't know how accurate it might or it might not be. But I think what's probably more important with a book like this is this book is actually to educate English men in Ireland who will be acting as justices of the peace, those local sort of gentry, middling status people who are expected to do administrative work for the state in their locality, and they have to hold uh, cases for those lower down misdemeanor crimes, or perhaps send them on to the, the professional judges for the more serious ones. And, um, and a book like this, I think, is essentially a way to educate these people. So it says something, A, about who's actually running Ireland, those that co colonial community aren't coming from gentry stock, so to speak, you know? Because what always happens, or what tends to always happen in a colonial sort of a setup like this is that the, the heirs to great fortunes don't come away to Ireland or to South America or to Africa. They tend to be people who don't have a lot of money in their home country, and that's why they leave to try and make their fortune elsewhere. And so maybe the people who are dispensing justice in Ireland are those figures who maybe aren't. This makes me sound very... Um, elitist or snobby is a word we'd use, but they're the people who are coming from England with nothing and all of a sudden they become somebody's. The greatest colonial figure within Ireland is the first Earl of Cork who arrives in, in Dublin literally with two shirts, one pair of trousers, one jacket, one sword, one dagger, and about 30 coins in a purse. And when he dies, one generation, when he dies, he's the wealthiest man in the three kingdoms of Scotland, England, and Ireland, with the exception of the king. Just one generation, you can go from absolutely nothing, unknown, little bit of education, but not much, and by hook and by crook, and he's very much a crook in many in many respects. So it's, I think a book like this is to educate these sorts of people as to their responsibilities, and I think it's it's important to, to note it. But it's also a brilliant book for somebody like me who's trying to actually understand just what exactly is the law in Ireland, because it's not always absolutely clear, because we don't have a lot of the previous... The, the sort of records that Ireland used to have before 1922, in which England may still have. Um, and so we, we, a book like this becomes very useful and very valuable just to figure out exactly what it is um, that, we're, that, we're, that we're using. So the, the process is really, it's not actually changed a huge amount in Ireland since, God forbid, since the Middle Ages, to be quite honest. We have a jury system. We have a system of public, the, the prosecution is is essentially taken by the state. Um, the, I suppose what's, there's no formal police system, that's a little bit different. We have a system of town watches and of constables, so it's local people, everybody has to do a bit. You'll have the first two weeks in January, the second two weeks in January, the first two weeks in February, second two weeks in February, and at night time you have to stay up and wander about your little part of the town and ensure that, that you're keeping an eye on people, that no fires are being set and all this sort of thing. So it's very much local police doing local police work. And in some ways that's great because Ireland is a very local sort of a place. Everyone knows everyone. People marry their cousins all the time, all this sort of thing. So it's very sort of, uh, sort of local in that sense. What's very interesting though is the complaint process is usually undertaken by the individual themselves. So if you are assaulted or if, you're, um, if you're, something is stolen from you, you essentially need to go to your local justice of the peace and make a complaint. And then when uh, when that comes to court hearing, you have to stand up and say, she stole my pig um, and give the, the sort of the, the um, give the, 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 the complaint some weight. Um, it's then heard by a system of grand jury, which is usually, like I say, 15 or more men, it's largely exclusively men, obviously, in this in this sort of a system. Uh, they're usually local gentry figures who then undertake a, a very preliminary co uh, consideration as to whether a trial should go ahead, where they look at prima facie evidence and either say there's nothing in this, it's not worth our time, 
or else to put it forward to the next stage. It's still a system that is used in, in America today. They still use a grand jury system. Usually uh, they go forward in, in, in the US, but we find a lot of the time they don't in Ireland. That's one of the real problems that we have in, in, in this process in Ireland is that very few crimes actually goes forward to, to trial, which is, I'm, I'm not sure exactly why that might happen. Um, the trial then is largely a loyalist trial. The state doesn't send a prosecutor down. Usually what happens is it's that local figure, either the victim themselves, um, or sometimes it might be that local administrative figure for the state who's not a professional lawyer at all. He's, he's a farmer or a landowner, and he does a bit of administration on the side, maybe half a day a week uh, on behalf of the state. Local administration, not just criminal justice, but all sorts of everything. And um, the jury will be 12 men. It's established really from the probably the late late 12th, or more so the early 13th century in Ireland. And again, it's 12 men. Today in Ireland, we have a stipulation that you should have nothing to do with the case, and you shouldn't know, excuse me, either the victim or the or the perpetrator, or the alleged perpetrator. But back in the Middle Ages and also into the early modern period, you did know the people, and it was seen as an advantage because you're familiar with the case, you have an understanding of what's going on, and therefore you can give a more informed decision and in in that sort of a way it kind of makes sense for the middle ages for that to happen um the they're usually chosen by the sheriff i think in most criminal justice systems that's not necessarily a big deal uh, sometimes we do know that when the state is making taking civil cases against landowners in the 17th century as part of that system of colonization to find in favor of the state against previous landowners either the old colonial community who have remained stubbornly Catholic and who have sort of integrated themselves into Gaelic Irish society uh, or just Gaelic Irish people, uh, generally speaking, that could be a problem. Frequently, the jury doesn't leave the, the, the jury box. They can be frequently heavily intimidated or instructed by the judge. You decide for yourself which is the appropriate terminology to use. Uh, the judge will give them, he would see it, uh, good advice and direction. Uh, the jury may be stubborn and not wish to do so. Sometimes juries can be put in jail for coming to the wrong decision if, if it's seen as being obstinately, absolutely wrong in the face of all evidence, you know. Um, it, that doesn't happen all that, all that often. But sometimes trials can be very, very short. Um, exactly how long in Ireland? Some of the more significant ones, for example, I, we, we remember significant trials of, of important people. They're the ones who survive in our sources. Certainly they can be as short as a half a day. But in England, for example, we've heard of cases in the Old Bailey in the 18th century, 15 minutes, 10 minutes even for a murder trial where somebody's going to die as a result. It's, it's quick. Do you know? Evidence is short. Procedure is very limited in terms of how you could slow down trials if you, if you wanted to. But they could be very short. I'm not saying necessarily all are. I honestly don't know about Ireland for sure, but I would imagine that they can be um, uh, quite short. That's just an image. We do have a, a liberty in Ireland remaining into the early modern period in a place called Tipperary, which is in the south midlands of the island. And because that's essentially a liberty, is it's very quickly just essentially it's a state within a state. And the local lord appoints his own chancellor, seneschal, judges, and local figures. And his books don't go to Dublin and don't go into that archive that gets blown up. So luckily for us, we still have them, you know. Um, and that's the list of the, the Magna Inquisitors, the Grand Jury, the 15 men listed down below. They're very useful, not just for legal history, but they're local for local, useful for local history, for people who want to see who are the significant gentry figures in their locality, who's going to do their just to do their their um, to undertake their responsibilities to society generally, because a lot of the time people will try and dodge going to jury duty. It happens still in Ireland to this day. People generally try to to avoid doing jury duty because it's stressful, it takes up a lot of time. If you do a murder case, it could be four weeks out of work sitting on the bench, you know. Um, so it's it's uh, it's something that comes up um, uh, quite a bit. And then um, that's our, again our standard record uh, for that's an entire trial record right there. Again, I'm very happy to share these slides if anybody wants to take a look. It says I'll just read it out to you while I'm I'm here. It says Ralph Wall is the name of the individual. You see him on the, the right, or sorry, on the left-hand side. It says indicted for the felonious 
and traitorous killing and murdering of one Philip Lonergan Taylor by giving unto the said Philip uh, one blow with a hatchet, a hatchet is a small axe, uh, one blow of a hatchet uh, to the value of one shilling, it's the cost of the hatchet, I'll explain that in a second, which in both his hands he held, and the forepart of the said uh, Lonergan his head, whereby he gave to the said one mortal wound to the depth of three inches, which is about that, and to the width of about four inches, which is about that, right down the middle of his head. And there the said Lonergan languished from the 2nd of August to the 4th of the same, in the 15th year of Charles II, on which the 4th of August the said Lonergan of the said wound died at Clonmel. And the, the reason why we get the value of the axe is a thing called the Deodont. This is actually a Germanic tradition. It's, it's not specifically English, as far as I know, where it's, 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 it's the, the value of the implement used to, to murder is given to the church. It's a, I think it's, it translates as something like the gift to God or something like that. And it's used all the time. And very frequently, the church come around to the court and collect whatever it is that might have been used. It's only outlawed in the 19th century where we get uh, murder manslaughter trials where people are hit by trains and all of a sudden the, ch the church show up wanting the value of one steam engine. Um, it kind of a corporate manslaughter sort of a thing. Um, the sentence is, is at the top. The word posse is, is here, first of all. Posse, um, that's an, a Latin abbreviation to means to put oneself on the country or to opt for a jury trial as opposed to pleading guilty. The word immediately afterwards is cul, C-U-L. It's an abbreviation for culpabilis, meaning guilty. He's found guilty of the crime. And then afterwards, the sentence to be hanged, drawn, and quartered. Because remember, even though it's just a normal murder, it's just two guys in an indistinct provincial town. One murders the other. But that's treated as a treason, so the punishment is going to be a lot harder as a, as a result. Um, in Ireland, uh, ostensibly, English legal historians are very proud of the fact that they don't have torture in the system, unlike those continental sort of backward continentals who torture people all the time, or at least that's the, the, the image that they like to give off. That's not necessarily the case, to be quite honest. Strictly speaking, yes, in the common law system, uh, which is in Ireland, they don't have torture, but we do frequently uh, use torture as part of what's called prerogative justice whereby the king can sort of, it's, 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 it's a highly disputed area in the 16th and the 17th century, but the way that it works in actuality is that the king can give special warrants to do certain things that may sit outside of the, the traditional common law system, and new courts are set up in the period, and they do sometimes use uh, torture. Uh, it's, when I speak of torture, I suppose I'm talking about pretrial torture, uh, torture as an encouragement to get information, um, as opposed to many of the post-trial punishments, which today would be definitely considered torture, you know, according to the UN Treaty for the Prevention of, of Torture and, and Inhumane Actions or whatever else that might be. Most of the time in Ireland, they're using a thing called a rack, which is a stretching device, tying a rope to your ankles and your wrists and literally turning a, a person who's 1 meter 80 into 1 meter 82 over a course of a few days. Uh, obviously, it's incredibly painful. They also use things like thumb, thumb screws and finger pillories at the time. This is one example of, uh, again, another uh, bishop. We'll have a few pictures of bishop. I don't know why I put up pictures of bishop speaker for some reason. It's this, because that uh, Dolly Boris is here. He probably wouldn't approve. Um, but this is a, a description of a particularly bad torture that doesn't sit within the traditional common law system, but it is used within Ireland. And I, I won't read out all of the details to you, but it involves um, placing, you can see the, that's an image, it's, it's, that's an image produced in Europe, but it's a, an Irish event where somebody is, has a boot put on their foot. And um, this, this is quite gross now, so I don't want to, to upset anyone, but, but you know, you know, his feet and legs were encased in top boots. Uh, which are then fixed with a mixture of salt, bitumen, oil, tallow, pitch, and boiling water, so various sorts of animal fats and things like that. And it's then placed on iron bars over a fire. And when the torture had lasted a whole hour, the pitch oil and other mixtures boiled up, burned off not only his skin, but also consumed his flesh, which was slowly destroyed the muscles, veins, and arteries. And when the boots were taken off, carrying with them a piece of roasted flesh, they left uh, no small part of the bones bare and raw. So it's like in a cartoon 
where you know it's just a, a skeleton hand kind of that's left over afterwards. And this is done in a legal sense. Uh, one of the figures in that picture, there's a bigger one I'll show you at the end. The Lord Chancellor of Ireland, the most senior legal officer of the state, is standing over the scene observing it and, and essentially uh, supervising it, um, which is, is very interesting in itself. Like I say, this is from a legal tradition that always boasts that it's so civilized it doesn't use torture, but it, 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 it very much does. Um, again, that's just a process when somebody refuses to plead, because if a person doesn't plead guilty or not guilty, the case can't progress. Um, and there's there's been a recent book by a lady called Sarah Butler who's wrote uh, an American on this process of uh, pain for de dure, whereas if the person doesn't plead, they place what is something similar to uh, planks of wood, like maybe a door over you, and then they just place weights on you. And they'll just keep on placing more weights until you either plead or expire. Now, you're going to die anyway, but in this case, for the person who doesn't die, who holds out and, and, and goes through the pain, uh, they're not found guilty. And when you're not found guilty, you're not, you don't lose your lands afterwards or your estate. So even though you die, your children can still inherit, which would not be the case normally um, in there. And then, like I say, just a few pictures of some things you might be familiar with in Central Europe. I think maybe the strapado. Uh, hanging people from from a height with their hands tied behind their back it causes immense pain as you can imagine on your shoulders and your joints the rack which i mentioned the the stretching device and then the other one which i think does not look too bad is the finger pillory it's literally just a little clamp for your fingers um, but again over time that will become incredibly painful when you can't stretch your hands out like and sometimes it's those little kind of torturous ones that that probably become um, sort of the works. Also within Ireland, so I've talked about statute law, I've talked about a traditional common law that becomes part of mainstream law based on judges' decisions and tradition. And then I talked also about um, the law of, of the king, prerogative law. And then finally in Ireland we have martial law, which again we'll be talking about in the next session, which I'm particularly looking forward to. Um, Martial law is essentially military law in most people's understanding of the terminology. During a wartime, the law is given special permission to act swiftly and to take to reduce the liberties of the subject because it's a time of emergency. What happens in Ireland, for instance, between 1603 and 1641, there's no war. It's a peaceful time in Ireland. There's no outbreaks of violence. But the state continues to use martial law. And the reason for doing this, I think, is what well, we're still trying to figure out um, it's a settled jurisdiction, like I say, it's being used not only in wartime, and it's consistently used in Ireland in the Elizabethan period from the 1550s onwards, and there are wars in, in, the, in the 1500s, but in the early 1600s there are none. And like I say, it's only used against the poor population because there's a property qualification. If you, uh, if you own property or movable wealth worth a certain threshold, you can't be prosecuted in this fashion. So is it a way of what we might call to a certain point maybe class cleansing that you can move people out of certain areas remember it's a colonial process so certain populations may need to be moved out of areas people who are seen as trouble in the locality particularly former soldiers who aren't willing to become farmers need to be moved out of ireland so they could be sent off to the caribbean or they could be simply executed on the spot and like i say it's not a court of record there's no nothing written down in this court so it's very difficult to know to what extent it's been used, but also to what extent it's been used outside of what we might call a, a genuinely just sort of a system or a just reason for, for, um, for killing someone. Like I say, the state would generally argue that the jury system in Ireland is unreliable, that people are not willing to find guilty. And a lot of the records I've been finding are suggesting that is the case, that when you put Irish people on the jury, they won't find against their own, their own people in favor of the state. Uh, that either the native population are unwilling to find against individuals or that they're being intimidated. At the same time, jurists who are helping to set up this, this new English system across the entire island, because once the war stops in 1603, all of Ireland is under total control now of the English crown, and the people who then move in immediately afterwards are the lawyers to set up the criminal justice system in areas where previously they didn't have any. And they're telling us, oh, it's great. The natives are coming to court. They trust us. They know we've got a very civilized legal system and they're, they're all for it. They're so happy. Uh, but then at the same time, they're having to use martial law. So there's a big 
sort of a contradiction. With something like martial law, with something like torture, with something like prerogative law, the state from the Middle Ages, in theory right up until today, will argue that the law is a civilizing process, that English intervention in Ireland is a civilizing process, taking uncivilized language, uncivilized law, uncivilized agricultural systems, rural dwellers trying to get them into towns, all of this sort of thing. It's all about getting rid of Irish barbarity and encouraging English civility. There's lots of this kind of judgmental tone that's still been used in 19th century Africa or in 16th century Spanish South America, and it's been used in Ireland at the same time. And so the big irony of the system is that in order to civilize Ireland, the English state is doing barbaric things. Because in England at the same time, they don't use martial law. There's far less, probably far less recourse to torture as well. So what lawyers and the state can get away with in Ireland in the 16th or the 17th century is something that they wouldn't dare do in England at the same time. So those liberties of the subject are obviously denigrated by, by, by dent of being in Ireland as opposed to being in England. And uh, another example, again, uh, a breaking on the wheel, something you do have in Central Europe, I don't know if you've ever used it, in the Balkans, where you essentially tie somebody to a wheel, smash their bones, literally put them through. In this case, uh, they, they hang him from the top of the church, so that all, and they leave him there for two or three days until he'll, he'll expire without water. But in this time, the birds and things are coming to pick at him. It's, it's an awful, awful uh, sort of a system to use, and such a peaceful looking location as well. The things that happened in the past um, is, is, uh, is truly, truly um, sort of uh, mild boggling. Then just, I'm, I'm, I'm conscious that I'm running very short on time. Uh, there's probably five categories of punishment within the Irish common law system. Again, you'll probably be familiar with most of these. What hasn't been mentioned, I don't think, so far in this conference is shame. The state uses embarrassment and humiliation to punish people, usually for low-down things such as um, it, it might be, for instance, something like adultery, you know, social crimes, so to speak. It's still used in Ireland today. The punishment for being caught by the police for going to the toilet on the street, if you've fallen out of a nightclub, the fine is, I think, about a euro or two euros. But what will happen all the time is your name goes into the local newspaper. So if you're 19 and you don't care about that, your mother definitely does. And that's the real punishment, because you don't want to uh, to feel the wrath. The wrath of the state is one thing, but the wrath of one's mother is, is something quite different. Um, they also use a thing called a pillory which is something like the stocks, so your head and your hands go through a plank of wood and you stand there, um, and that's, that's the humiliation. Sometimes people may throw things at you, anything, stones, bricks, feces, uh, all sorts. Uh, if they're on your side, such as in the case of someone like Daniel Defoe, an author who's, um, who's, who's prosecuted in London, and he's very popular, the stage are out to get him, but public support is by him, people put garlands of flowers around his neck. And this, again, is, is the thing, I'll talk about this in a moment, financial um, punishments, fines, where the state takes money as your punishment. Again, we're still using those today. Incarceration does come up in Ireland quite a bit as well. And from probably from the late 16th, certainly into the early 17th century, we've got legislation in 1635 that establishes state-funded, or sorry, funded in the locality, but through taxation, uh, houses of correction which are both used as prisons, as punishment, and I'll show you some court records where we have those, but also um, the punishment is, um, it, it's also used as a kind of an early version of a workhouse where you place people who are what they call sturdy but idle vagabonds, essentially establishing in people's mind at this time the difference between the poor who deserve our pity and the poor who deserve our hatred the deserving poor and the undeserving poor, those people who can't work and those people who won't work, those sorts of ideas are used quite a bit. And like I say, we have a jail system established around these areas. Um, I won't read out all, all of this, but sometimes jail is used again in the, in the colonial setting, particularly in this case of religion, where town, the, the, the sort of town uh, leaders 
the, 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 the people who are leading local towns who won't convert to Protestantism at the time of the Reformation are being jailed on that basis. And they've been punished in prison in terms of not being allowed to remove their, you know, human waste. They're not getting food. They've been kept in dark conditions, uh, all of that stuff. But we're certainly seeing jails around about this time. And then up to things like corporal punishment, which, again, are fairly standard across parts of the um, of the continent. Whipping is obviously used quite a bit. Usually there's a class thing. There's a brilliant article recently by Krista Kesselring uh, in Canada on whipping and its use in terms of class. It's grand for the lower classes. When they start using it against the middling sorts, uh, it becomes more problematic for people. The pillory, which I've talked about, branding, which again we use, usually it's a letter. So if you've seen the start of the Pirates of the Caribbean movie, you'll see the letter P is written on his hand, that sort of thing. It might be B for blasphemer, T for thief, and it usually goes on to here, or here, or usually here is the most obvious place, and that's a mark forever. And it's used sometimes in a thing called benefit of clergy, whereby this is a, a, a provision in, in, in law and common law. I don't know if it's used on the continent, it might be, whereby the church courts have control over clergy, and the secular courts have control over the rest of the population. If you can prove that you're a clergyman, you, you will then be sent off to the church courts. This goes all the way back in England to a time of Henry II and Thomas Becket and the, 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 the eternal struggle, it seems, between the church and the state. And you essentially just have to read out one single verse of the Bible. It's always the same one. It's Psalm 50, uh, called the, the Misere. Um, it's a specific, 50 in some Bibles, Psalm 51 in, in others. Uh, what usually happens is people just learn it off and you get to use that kind of get out of jail free card once and you're branded and once you've been branded you can't be unbranded and that's the mark that they've left you with. Uh, we have some cruel judges in Ireland who will sometimes specifically ask you to read another psalm instead because what happens is most people are illiterate so they just simply learn it off. Uh, but what one of what, one of the judges that I deal with does things a little different. And then capital punishment again. In theory the punishment for almost all felonies. Hanging is the regular one. Uh, for traitors, then for women, they're burnt. Sometimes they'll be strangled in advance, but they are burnt. Um, and the hanging, drawing, and quartering, which I've already described um, for men. Obviously, the, for the women, it's different because of, I suppose, public nudity is, is all I can come up with in, in, as to why that would or wouldn't be um, one. Like I say, treason is extended in Ireland probably a little bit more than it is in England to include house burning, burning crops in the field, murder, which I've spoken about, arson in royal dockyards, these sorts of things. And again, it's just to bring a certain class of criminal into the more inhumane form of punishment. Uh, as far as I can see, that's the real reason. Because it's not what anybody really thinks of as being genuinely treason behavior, you know. Um, also, as we see, as I mentioned already, we have what we might call the PR uh, of punishment, the the, 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 the struggle between the individual and the state, because the state needs the community to buy into the system, as it does today. We all need to believe that the system is, generally speaking, just, and that transgressors who break the law are appropriately punished, not too light, not too harsh. Now, in a colonial setting, that may not be the case, because remember, Ireland is a strange country on the edge of Europe in that about maybe 80%, maybe 75%, to 80% remain Catholic, even though the state, there's an official state church which is Protestant. So you can't be an officer in the army or be a judge or be an administrator. And the land ownership is going from 100% Catholic to the end of the 1600s down to about maybe 9%, even though, so it's very much a colonial elite. So you will find sometimes areas where there's a rejection of the criminal justice system by individuals because they're rejecting the whole state uh, imposition of religion, law, societal norms, all that sort of thing. And it does sometimes happen. So there's a, another bishop, again, who's killed in 1612, whereby he's a traitor, so officially the community should despise him and should be happy to see him die. But instead, before his execution, he gives a speech. He preaches in Latin, in Irish, and in English. Uh, speaking Irish in Dublin, which has always been an English city, always been a royal city, uh, to be for a priest, to be preaching Irish there. All of the people in the crowd on their knees saying their prayers. And when his head is chopped off, 
they hold up his head and say, behold, the head of a traitor. And all of the, the crowd respond, um, I can't remember the exact Latinism, but essentially saying there's the head of a saint in front of us, um, which is a very interesting rejection of state power. So even though the individual is going to die, the way he dies, he has power and the state doesn't because the crowd are on his side. He's remembered as a state, as a saint, and the state are remembered as somebody who kills uh, a, a state. Now, this is the last point I want to make because I know I'm running out of time. What is written on paper in the books, the statute law, because we can pour over all of these treatises, but a lot of the time they're written by individuals who don't practice law or don't see how law works in practice or in actuality. The theory is fine, but sometimes it's not the same. Or those who leave us opinions. So in theory, the state is violent. It has, as we mentioned yesterday, it has the monopoly on violence within the state. It, violence in theory is wrong. Hurting somebody else is wrong. But when the state does it, it's right. It's this form of justice. It's, 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 it's odd, like the state kidnaps people. It locks them up in prisons. It hurts them. It takes their money. In any other situation, you're the criminal. When the state does it, it's, it's a beautiful form of justice, so to speak. But in Ireland, we know that it has that, that um, idea of violence. But there are alternatives to it. And I would suggest, perhaps because the juries have a lot of Irish people within them, but also because the, the state is maybe just generally unwilling to punish people too hard, that maybe, the, so the theory, and Irish nationalist historians who will say the extension of English justice is just the extension of state violence in Ireland, maybe we need to reel that back in a little bit and say that what actually happens in real life is a little bit different to the theory of what should have been happening. So, for example, here is a court case of a woman who kills her husband. And just really quickly, it says um, she's, she's found guilty of murdering her said husband and judgment uh, thereupon uh, given against her to be drawn and burnt. Remember, she kills her husband, so it's a, it's a murder, therefore it's a treason. And having then demanded the benefit of her belly, and thereupon found by a jury of women, she's examined by women, and the women confirm she's pregnant. So you can't kill her because you're essentially killing somebody else. Once it's in the, the second trimester, by which point insolment has taken place, that the fetus now has a soul, therefore it'd be wrong to kill it. So she's to remain, uh, to, to, to continue in jail until she should give birth. Now, whether she's actually pregnant or not, I don't know. If she's not, it would be a very good idea to, for her to become pregnant. But at this point, the state isn't willing to kill. And what I would argue, we don't know what happens to her afterwards. I would argue because that child then becomes a cost on the community, she's not going to be killed. I would suggest that if you can get, the longer you can survive in jail, the better chance you have of not being executed. I would argue the state isn't necessarily always violent in those sorts of situations. Um, again, this is another record. Again, I, I realize I can't read this myself. By the way, most of the time, this handwriting is atrocious. I'm not expecting you can. This is a, less, a list, again, of cases being held in County Ron, and I came across it in California, of all places. It's really interesting. And what you can see here is ignoramus. That means we can't find anything in the bill. That, that's a crime. Okay? Ignoramus, ignoramus. Uh, that's a bill of error, true bill. Ignoramus, ignoramus. All of those cases are not being prosecuted. What I would argue is that despite people coming into contact with the criminal justice system, those who are coming out the other side is a much small number. Imagine what would happen in various countries across Europe if the, if the criminal justice system, we'll say, if the, in Ireland it's called the Department of Public Prosecutions. I'm sure there's an equivalent here in Serbia or in Poland or wherever else if maybe 5% of the cases that they put forward ended up in guilty verdicts and 95% ended up in not guilty or were not prosecuted against, there would probably be uproar. Certainly there would be in Ireland at least. This seems to be what happens. Again, I'm not expecting you to be able to read this. It's, it's way too low. These are the, the, the verdicts. This is just a snapshot of a much bigger database that I'm compiling. Uh, two guilties here, House of Correction and to be whipped. Uh, all of these are not guilty. One guilty gets benefit of clergy, tends to be a priest, and then not guilty. Not one more guilty has the correction. Everybody else on that list gets off, not not being not being prosecuted, not being executed, not being fined, 
not going to jail, not going to the pillory, not going to somewhere else. It seems to me, like I say, using the House of Correction quite a bit. It's a good way of dealing with women in the system, particularly, I think, whether it's today, certainly in Ireland, we know there's a discrepancy between male and female sentences. Female ones tend to be a little bit shorter. Just I, I, why, I don't know if it's the jury or the judge or maybe just society generally is uncomfortable with punishing women heavier. It, I realize that's a much bigger discussion for a much bigger time, but it seems to be the same here that we downgrade women crimes sometimes to that of felony. So that now whipping is not pleasant. I'm not suggesting it is, but probably a more pleasant experience than being executed. Um, and then finally, what we also see, and again, this character Chichester to Davies, these are two classic colonial men. Our English administrators in Ireland with a very big reputation for ultra-violence. Historians have picked out the examples in their letters where they're very happy to see large swathes of people. Chichester in particular, his brother is killed by the Irish. He is utterly hatred of, of the Irish in the, in the area, and he becomes... The, the, he literally sees his brother's head being kicked about as a football across a river. Uh, so he's, he's got very personal, great animosity. And he becomes Lord Lieutenant. He's the King's representative in Ireland, so head of government. And here he is signing off on pardons for literally hundreds of convicted people. Again, there's a huge amount of pardons being given out as well. Why? I don't know. I don't understand that. He is a violent man, and he does hate the Irish, and he's happy to see lots of them die. But at the same time, we're also seeing lots. And they're poor people as well. It's not like he's saving them so that he can find them. A lot of these people are, these be but mean men, we'll pardon them. They have no money. They're, they're from the very lower levels of society. In theory, they're the people that don't matter or shouldn't matter in our society. So um, the conclusions that I would have are tentative. What I would suggest is that for those entering this, what in theory is a very violent system, the conviction rate is relatively low. Maybe because the system is so violent that that is why the conviction rate is low. If you look at England, say, for example, say for the, the heinous crime of rape, for example, in the 19th century, there's a very low conviction rate. As soon as they pass the Offences Against the Person Act, which I think is 1850 or 1862, something like that, the conviction rate for rape doubles overnight. Because nobody is executing for rape after this point, the jury is willing to convict. And maybe when you lessen the punishment, you're more likely to convince a jury of guilt. Because the jury aren't thinking about whether the person is guilty or not guilty. They're thinking, are they going to die afterwards? And is that a suitable punishment for them? And that might be the case. So maybe we need to say that to right-wing politicians. If we actually lower the amount of time that people are spending in jail, you'll actually get a higher rate of conviction. And that seems to be borne out, or at least it's the opinion of some judges in Ireland today as well. It's certainly not the system of 18th century London, where it's got a very high reputation for, you know, in London, for example, in the 18th century, they developed what's called the Bloody Code, where at the start of the, say, in the 1650s, 1660s, about 50 offences in England have a death sentence attached. By the early to mid-18th century, that's 200 uh, uh, offences lead to, to punishment. And the, the punishment rate goes very... It's, it's a total misnomer. I heard the phrase yesterday, enlightenment, and it's still called the Enlightenment in England in the 18th century, yet they're executing way more people for, for nothing crimes, for theft of very small items with relatively small amounts. There's usually a threshold of 12 pence on the worth of the value. And as inflation, as we know all about it today, that, 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 that threshold comes closer and closer, you know. So the amount of people being killed for, like I say, nothing crimes is, is very interesting. Um, it might be also that martial law system takes out criminals of the system that aren't recorded because it's not a court of record. It doesn't have a paper trail that historians can follow. So it might be that those people are taking out. The unwillingness to hand criminals, I don't know, pity, maybe, gender, maybe. It seems there's probably a little bit of that at least. A sense of humanity, maybe. Maybe there's a fear of revenge. Remember, when you're the colonial elite, you're small in number but big in power. Okay, just like being a white person in South Africa will say, you may be scared. The nights are long and dark in Ireland in the winter. And what you don't want after you've been on a jury or where you're a local judge when you hang somebody is to find out that his five brothers are coming up the road and you hear a knock, knock, knock on the door when it's dark in the middle of winter. So it might be that people are fearful of, of, of vengeance because the, they're living in the community, but they're not part of us because they're a different religion and they're a different ethnicity and they like the idea of, of keeping that within. 
And um, so I would also say incarceration, as seen in, in, in the stuff that I've been working on, is an alternative and can allow for punishment without a death penalty. And that's good. Not corporal, not capital, but just incarceration. The benefit of clergy, which is extended, like I say, to women in 1635, is very important. And then the process might be the punishment. Okay? Could it be that what is remand, holding somebody in prison until their trial, is an effective punishment? So it kind of puts the frighteners on them. Do you know? It's like when a teenager is in trouble, you, the, the police might take him in, leave him in the cell for the night, scare him into becoming a good kid. Maybe there's a little bit of that going on. Um, maybe goods and animals are given back to the individual. We have senses that this might be happening. Um, there might be an arbitration going on that we don't know about. There's one source of Jesuit letters from Ireland going to Jesuit headquarters in Rome that suggests that Jesuit priests are working as arbitrators all the time, be they on civil matters or criminal matters, that they're solving problems. They don't want their uh, constituents, their Catholic members of their church, going to what they see as heretical courts. They don't want them going to the Protestant courts. So it might be that there's a whole underground criminal justice system, call it, that, that where solutions have been found and problems have been solved without recourse to the official royal courts. Um, and then finally, we might ask ourselves, what did the, the common people think? Did they accept that justice system or did they reject it? There's a sense that it might be that they rejected it. In that second course there, for example, when there's a breakdown in, a breakdown in society in the 1640s, there's a widespread violence part of the general 17th century crisis in, in Europe generally. We notice there that in one case, there's a jury of women who try a man. Uh, again, women don't sit on juries, so this isn't typical. And try a man and suggest the name of the woman is Catherine Fury. Fury is a, a common surname in Ireland, but it also to me suggests, you know, furious. Um, and they hang him. They hang him. And I'm still trying to figure out, is this a mockery of justice? Do you know, it would be like putting a hat on a pig. Do you know, it's so ridiculous that 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 it's 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 not just about killing a guy that they don't like, but it's also about making a mockery of the system. That it might be something like that. Because the this section above, the other one above that, is in the same war in the 1640s. They bring a horse into the court and they try him. He's 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 accused of being a Protestant horse. So they put the Bible in front of him and say, will you read this in Latin? And the horse refuses to read in Latin. So naturally, he's found guilty and he's executed. And again, I think that's making a sort of a joke of that system, you know. Um, and it's very interesting. There's a brilliant book by Evans published in 1908 on the criminal prosecution and capital punishment of animals. And it's, it's a really important idea. It sounds ridiculous now. It's something you can entertain first years with, you know, if they look like they're getting bored. But it's a, it's a really interesting uh, there's, there's huge areas, I think, that are fascinating within us. And then um, these attitudes suggest that we might further question the inherent nature of early modern state violence. Um, it, we might also note that the law permits the stage to engage in a very high level of violence, much higher than that in England. So even though they're bringing civility to Ireland, they're doing so in a very barbaric fashion, which to me doesn't sound very civilized. At all, and the colonial theorists today, and the racial and sectarian attitudes, uh, then suggest that that the ultra violence based on those factors should have seen the Irish criminal su justice system react in a far more vicious and violent manner. But some of the results that we see in the actual court, when we actually throw the theorists out for a minute and look at what actually happened, can sometimes be very, very different. And I think that's me all done. So thank you. I, I probably spoke far too long there, I'm conscious of, but I, I'm happy to take questions if there are any. You can stop sharing the presentations. Very good. So any questions, comments? There's just, yeah. I think I'm back on now. Yes, you are. Yeah. Until people have something, I wrote down a few things myself. 
Uh, first, uh, regarding the classification of murder and arson and things like that as treason, was that just a purely technical way, like, let's upgrade them to a class of crime that's punished more severely, or was there some sort of explanation as to why would that qualify as treason? Like, I don't know, it's treason against the king to hil kill his subjects or something like that. And uh, regarding the houses of correction you mentioned as the earliest prisons, so to speak, what did they look like, actually? What, what was a, an inmate's day like and how did they try to correct them? Right. Um, the, the answer to the first question is, is, is a fairly straightforward one. It's written in the Act at the very beginning, uh, where it literally says that in the preamble or the proviso at the start, it literally says, uh, because the Irish do not take the punishment of, of hanging seriously enough, because it's a lawless place and there's too many murders, we need to up the level of punishment. And that's why we're recategorizing it as a treason. That's the 1495 Act. Later acts relating to things like house burning and arson, I can't remember off the top of my head if it makes any stipulation, but my my inclination is that it almost certainly doesn't, that it's it's just, that there's it's it's simply that we just want to bring more into the catchment of, of the more violent uh, punishment. Um, for the house of correction, uh, I don't know that we've got examples, I'm, I'm still at the early stages of looking into them. I know what the legislation says it should look like, but what it actually looked like might be quite different. We, I think, as far as I understand it, that there's gender segregation within the prison. Uh, men on one side, women on another. That's not necessarily always the case. This is one of the first examples of um, a, a new sort of institution within Ireland that is actually planned from the start. Because there have been jails before where people are held but usually you just hold them until their trial and then you punish them and send them on their way. Uh, this is a place being built, which is sort of a, a sort of a social engineering project, if you like, where we can actually create a, an institution that works, but it's aspirational in some ways. It's both about controlling the poor in society, where you can either send them back to their parish if they won't go, you can put them into this place and they're put to work within it. Labor is part of that system. And what's really interesting is they can, in theory, actually earn money from that as well, in that they can be, I don't know if they're being paid much, I don't know, again, what the practical application of that is, but that's what it's stipulated within it. So it should have a work area, it should have a living area, there's sections of that statute which are set down about the exact responsibilities of the governor, what his rights are, how much he's to be paid, uh, there is a permission to get, administer what they term a light whipping, to encourage people towards a, a more productive lifestyle. Sounds like <laughs> working in Google or Apple or one of these new corporations where it says, we're really, really nice, but at the same time, we're awful. <laughs> but, um, so it's, it, it, we have an idea of what they're like. Um, they're not all built straight away. The law is passed in, I can't remember exactly when, either 30, 1635 or 1636. But we know from town records, they're still trying to gather the money together in the years after that, so it doesn't happen straight away, but institutions never react that quickly, I think. Um, but it's, it's, it's a really interesting sense, and we do see from those legal records from trials that judges are willing to to send people for three, three months, a few weeks, uh, sometimes just until next Saturday is one. You know, so the punishment is the incarceration, they're happy to do that. Whether they receive additional punishment within that is, you know, it's a, a different sense. Um, I don't know what people think of the loss of liberty or the loss of time that they have, you know, because the modern prison system, obviously, we send people away for so, so much longer today. It would be unthinkable to send somebody away. For, in Ireland these days, for a murder, you're looking at usually around about 20 years. And it's a life sentence, so your parole de decides, not the judge. And then the Minister for Justice has to sign off on it. He always goes with what the parole board recommends, or mostly. But you're looking at approximately 20 years. That would be unthinkable to somebody in the early modern period, you know. Um, and it's it's quite destructive, you know. I always ask students, what would you prefer to do? Uh, two years in a and prison isn't particularly nice in Ireland. It's not always safe. It's not it's not comfortable. Or a short term punishment to your body, do you know? Because we have, for instance, mutilation branding, it's just a burn, it heals, you know, or the removal of somebody's ear, for example, or they can cut you through the tongue, 
with a nail. You know, but half the teenagers in Ireland have, have studs in their in their tongue. What's the difference? You know, it's it's pain, but it's temporary versus the loss of time, which and prison can be very destructive on your psychological well being, sometimes on your physical well being. Do you know? They all say prison, but I think I'd take the physical. Okay, so I have a question because there were so many interesting plots within your presentation that I almost couldn't decide, but there is one thing that particularly drew my attention. It's the uh, justice of peace, because you mentioned, and it's a very uh, funny thing, uh, because in Poland, Poland is considered a country of mixed jurisdiction, but we, we are not common law, we, we don't have anything like that. But there is an idea, there has been an idea for several years, to introduce uh, this institution back to Poland, I mean, no, back because we didn't have it, but <laughs> introduced into Polish law. So I was um, interested how it looked like, because I might have missed this point about your presentation. Is there any remain of uh, justice of peace in the in the uh, modern uh, Irish law, or not really? In in modern contemporary society, no, there's not. Um, the nearest thing you would have is there is a, a function that can be performed by local people uh, that, that has some element of the, the local administrative work. It's literally when you apply for a passport, you need somebody to, to acknowledge that you are who you claim to be. So you can sign their document, but there's nothing to it. There's no criminal justice function whatsoever. However, in England, which is also a common law system, they do have a system of magistrates who uh, can deal with very low level offending and they are lay people, they're not professional lawyers and um, you will be assisted by the clerk of the court who knows the law but you are a representative of the common people, the, the, the average everyday sort of, and for, for again it's mostly minor things, anything serious has to go up to a, a more senior court but in theory the first the first hearing that anyone will have in the criminal justice system should come through that court so even for a murder or terrorist offence, you have to go to a magistrate court first. They always get sent up, obviously, to a more senior court. Um, but in those cases, you can have... Now, whether it's a good idea or not, who knows, because who, who applies to become a court in a junior... in a, a judge in a junior court where you don't really get paid? I don't think you get paid at all. You know, people who want to... Get, you know, people who are probably bullied at school or something. Um... My, my, my professor in my department, Axis One, in the past when he lived in, in England, uh, he's, he's very balanced, but I often wonder about what sort of people do that, you know, um, whether you should leave it to professional judges, are they out of touch? That's a problem as well. You know, a ju judge, they never really go out into the real world, but, you know, in Ireland they're discouraged from ever being out late because they have to show responsibility. They can't be seen in nightclubs or pubs or things like that. But then most of the offending that comes to them will be as a result of people taking drinks. So the, the one thing they're not allowed to observe in reality is this thing that they're frequently having to judge. Do you know? Um, so no, the quick answer is we don't have it in Ireland anymore. Um, whether it's a good thing or a bad thing, I'm not sure. I think I prefer the professional judges. But, but then sometimes there, there is a problem with them as well because they all come from the same types of schools, the same class. They all come from lawyers. They're all formerly lawyers themselves. So you have to work maybe 20 years as a, as a lawyer before you could be considered to be a judge. You know? And you get one type of person who's gone to law school, probably comes from a well-to-do family, you know, and they, they, they pick up all of their, their biases, as we all have biases, you know. Um, so that's, that's a problem as well, though, you know. So you've mentioned that uh, benefit of the clergy several times. Was there any difference between the uh, Catholic clergy and Protestant one? Um, ostensibly, it, I mean, it's called benefit of the clergy, but the, the kind of the big joke is none of them are clergy. So it's it's literally whereby you you it's it's a legal fiction. It's it, that's what it's best described as. It's literally if you can read this one psalm. The misere may uh, forgive me, Lord, for my inadequacies, blot out my transgressions, um, it, and that's your way of proving, in the medieval sense, that you were a clerk, a, a clericos, which means a man in holy orders, uh, which is why women couldn't 
uh, apply for that. Their version is benefit of the belly, you know, where you've got 70 year old women claiming to be pregnant. And the court go, oh, yeah, yeah, that's very believable. I, I could definitely understand that. Um, and this is the one where the men can get off once uh, for an, an act. Now, over time, their legislation is, is starting to restrict the use of benefit of clergy. It, it, it is a very odd thing to have, you know, where essentially everybody's allowed one crime before they can be prosecuted for another one. And you will get branded, which identifies you as, as somebody who's already been convicted. And then if it happens a second time, you can't apply for, for, for this benefit of clergy. So initially, yes, it was a way for priests, like back in, say, 1200, not to be caught up in the secular criminal justice system because the church courts had authority over their own priests. Um, and then just over time, everybody starts to realize that if I can read, I can I can claim to be a clerk. And so the legal fiction is established, and then once it's established, everybody else can claim it as well. So it's 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 everybody can, can apply for it, Catholics, Protestants. And after 1635, in theory, women can as well. So even though we extend it to women in the 1630s, there are always laws saying, you know, horse stealing should not be allowed benefit of clergy and, you know, highway robbery shouldn't be allowed benefit of clergy. So we're constantly restricting it at the same time as well, you know. But like I say, it's it's simply a legal fiction. You literally, and lots of people who, who claim it can't read, their friends tell them what to say. They just learn off. It's two sentences and that's it, you know. Uh, you mentioned that uh, the upgrades, shall we say, of murder to a uh, treason was because there were many murders in your Ireland at the time. So my question is, since the criminal system was such that not many people were prosecuted, was there any reduction of murder cases in Ireland due to this, or was it ineffective? Thank you. Um, the, the statute law claims there was lots of murders. Um, now, every piece of legislation from the Irish Parliament is a product of the state. And the only people who are sitting in the Irish Parliament are generally from the English community at the time. And that, in 1495, is literally what we would today call the Greater Dublin Area. If you can commute from an area into Dublin, you're living in this area, which we call the Pale. For you know, So it's essentially the English community uh, saying this, whether there is actually lots of murder, you would think there probably is if they're passing a law for it. Do you know, it, it, usually legislation is a reaction to what is happening in society. Although we have laws against witches, and I don't think there is genuinely any of those who we were all either. But, you know, so, so okay, let's, let's work on the assumption that there is, uh, that Ireland is a violent place and it's chaotic and all of that sort of thing. Um, it's really difficult to say whether, was your question, did the act actually help to reduce the numbers of murders? Did, did it work as such? I don't know, the, uh, to be honest. The incineration of all of those records makes it really hard to say for sure. And what you've got in Ireland, because the English state is relatively small, the areas outside this are the March areas, the borderlands, which are kind of hybrid, part Irish, part English communities. People are marrying. And the, the power of the state doesn't extend into those areas much. It does a little bit, and beyond it, definitely not. So it's really difficult to say what is, you, you know, I, we just don't have those sorts of crime figures to say. But one of the, the things that I do, I have found, I, I quoted in that Journal of Legal History article at the end, is a letter from one judge who's on circuit. So the judges in Ireland travel around to the localities to dispense justice. And he writes back and he, to the headquarters and he said, there's nothing going on. The jail's empty. There's no, there's no, it's like a wonderland. He's like, literally, I have one rape in here. And other than that, all of the other prisoners have done little things, nothing serious. And otherwise, it's very calm and very peaceful. Um, where politicians write to London, they're saying, Ireland's a bit wild. Give us power to control us. So what, what politicians say, what the judges say to them is it's actually reasonably peaceful at that time at least but then what the politicians might write back to london saying is you know give us more power because because we need um we, we need control you know so who knows it's it's really difficult to say but it's it's a very interesting question though you know thank you 
If there aren't any more questions, we're right on time. Thank you, Coleman, once again. We take a 15-minute break and then see you for the next session.